Let's we'll stop up right over here. Each year, Lopez takes teenagers from East L.A. 300 miles north to Mono Lake so they can see where some of their water comes from. It's an unusual mountain lake rimmed with strange natural structures made of lime. They're called tufa towers. How old is the tufa? Yeah. This tufa in this grove is probably, some of it's as old as a thousand years. But a lot of it's really young, 75 to 200 years. And yet it's above ground and tufa only forms underwater. So we know that the lake has dropped pretty quickly. Mono Lake was recently the center of heated environmental controversy. The lake's level had drained down because water from its feeder streams was being diverted to Los Angeles. But a state water board decision in 1994 stopped the diversions, and now its waters are slowly rising. Pour off a little of the excess water. So Mono Lake is a place that captures people's hearts and minds. I think what we all realize is that there are Mono Lakes at the ends of all of our taps, or these special places that are the source of our water supplies. In the future, conservation and recycling will become even more important to Los Angeles. The loss of water from Mono Lake has increased the need to conserve. The city also knows that it will eventually have to give up some of the Colorado River water on which it depends, water that belongs to states upstream. And by treaty, a portion of the Colorado's water belongs to Mexico. There's a very fundamental problem with the Colorado River. There was a very rainy year, and then all the politicians sat down to divide up the amount of water, and they made a, a very large mistake. They divided up more water than they've ever had since. Uh, it hasn't rained as much and haven't had as much water uh, since the time that they divided it up. So what you have is uh, you've over-allocated that river. You've given away more water than you really had. The seven states and two nations that share the Colorado have been described as thirsty dogs fighting over a damp sponge. This is one of the few wetlands remaining in the Colorado Delta, just south of the border. It gives a small idea of what the Delta used to be like before dams upstream diverted the river's waters. In 1922, the great American conservationist, Aldo Leopold, paid a visit to the Colorado Delta and wrote about it in a marvelous essay in the Sand County Almanac, his, his masterwork. Uh, what he found there was a paradise for wildlife. There were jaguars, cougars, bobcats, teamed with waterfowl. It's so ironic that in that year, the Colorado River Compact was signed, and that began shutting off the flow of water to the Delta. So the Delta is now starved, and it's essentially a dead zone. Everything that Leopold saw there is gone. Leopold described the Colorado Delta as a milk and honey wilderness full of a hundred green lagoons. The region provided habitat for species that live mostly in zoos today. Endangered creatures like the jaguarundi, lynx, and Mexican wolf. Today, the Colorado Delta has been transformed into miles of dried out salt flats. Except in the wettest years, the river no longer makes it to the Gulf of California its historic destination. Virtually nothing is reaching the delta in an average year. And so the ecosystem has been completely changed. Um, and the native communities that have relied on this ecosystem and this water for thousands of years are now suffering and very much in decline themselves. Fisheries in this region are in severe trouble, in part because of overfishing, but also because diversions of water upstream have damaged the Delta spawning grounds. Yeah. 
The Kokopa Indians who live in the Delta once had a thriving culture of fishing and riverbank farming. <laughs> Their way of life is now in jeopardy. Weeds choke the river behind their village. It's barely a foot deep. No, pues la, la agua del río, pues es de mucha importancia porque es la, pues es donde vivimos nosotros, toda la comunidad aquí, en la pesca y en, pues todo, ¿no? Porque pues sin el agua, pues, y a ver ahorita cómo estamos aquí, fracasados por la cuestión, pues por falta del agua. Today, for their household needs, the Cocopa rely upon water brought in by the barrel. They say bathing is basically a teacup affair. As for fishing, the Cocopa must now haul their boats 40 miles to get to the saltwater channel of the Gulf of California. By the time they've bought fuel for both the trucks and the boats, it becomes a costly trip. <laughs> Fishing is a community activity for the Cocopa, but it's mainly the young men who go out in the boats. These waters were once rich fishing grounds, and fishermen's gill nets were filled with corvina and totuaba. But on this day, they catch nothing. Finally, after many hours of effort, they give up and head for home. It is a very long trip indeed. The community's young people still hold fast to the tribe's identity as river people. They've chosen the name pescadores, or fishermen, for the soccer team. But as their parents know, their future is clouded by the problems with the Colorado River. <laughs> Perhaps, if the true potential of conservation could be realized and the benefits distributed fairly, there would someday be enough water for everyone. To restore the Colorado River Delta will take a lot, and it's probably impossible to go back to what it used to be last century. But it's also a lot of things that can be done with just allowing some water to come in at particular times of the year. And I think a good important lesson is when we look at other deltas, we should now carefully look at the environmental impacts that damming and irrigation projects will have. We should not repeat what we did with the Colorado River, because those things do not reverse. In the end, we may need a new water ethic, an ethic that says it's important now to begin sharing water with each other as well as with nature. There's an old proverb that goes something like, uh, the frog does not drink up the pond in which it lives. And I think it's a very simple wisdom, but it, it really captures the challenge, I think, that we're facing, which is how we're going to meet our growing human needs for water and still live in balance with the ecosystems that support all life.